But in the interim, I have the honor to introduce to you our next session, which is share your values and incentives. Share your values and incentivize your extended supply chain. See, this wasn't my session. <laughs> I would like to introduce Mark Robertson, Director of Communications and Stakeholder Relations, ICTI Care Foundation. And I'd also like to introduce Kate Dunbar, Subject Matter Expert of Human Trafficking, Ascent Compliance. So I know you do not want to miss this, this session, and um, please welcome both Mark and Kate. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes, I'm often told I have a very small voice, so let me know if uh, I'm not loud enough. I'm just going to figure out how this works. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, thanks for being here for the session. Um, my name's Kate Dunbar, and um, yes, so I'm the subject matter expert on human trafficking and ascent compliance. So Mark and I uh, would like to engage you today in a discussion around anti-human trafficking due diligence in supply chains and how you are going about assessing risk and mitigating risk of human trafficking in your business and in your supply chain and further than that going beyond compliance and risk mitigation um, what are your success stories and challenges in terms of engaging workers from the ground up and reducing their vulnerability to better protect them and to better protect your companies against human trafficking. So before we launch into today's topic, I'll tell you a little bit more about my organization, myself, and my background. So I work for Ascent Compliance, and we are a data software company. And essentially, we help uh, our customers, uh, who usually have very long, complex, and non-transparent supply chains, we help them collect data from their supply chains, uh, assess that data, and look for areas of risk, but also compliance, compliance to different legislation. And so... Uh, in, in terms of our anti-human trafficking uh, solution, we're looking at tracking compliance against, for instance, the amended U.S. federal acquisition regulations rule on combating human trafficking. But we're also looking at identifying risks, and then we have an automatic sort of gen automatic process to generate mitigation activities uh, for suppliers, and we help suppliers in mitigating risk and provide guidance and training uh, for them to do so. So a little bit about me. Um, before I joined Ascent Compliance, I was in a totally different world. So uh, I was at the forefront of humanitarian emergencies, both as a child protection and emergencies, in emergencies specialist with uh, international non-governmental organizations. And I worked as a support worker and advocate for survivors of human trafficking. So I've seen firsthand the links between conflict, natural disasters, poverty, discrimination, and increased vulnerability of individuals to labor exploitation, including in supply chains. And many of the women and men and children that I've worked with experienced um, exploitation because of their vulnerability. And ended up in exploitation in supply chains, including on factory floors, uh, within hotels, uh, in construction work, and so on. So it's really interesting for me to have sort of moved uh, throughout my career from along the supply chain, if you like, starting working with the individuals uh, who are most affected by these human rights violations, and today having the opportunity to work with companies and their suppliers to mitigate the risk of this happening in the first place. So why did Mark and I believe that it was important to engage you today in a discussion around modern slavery and human trafficking? After all, these issues are not new. We've heard about child labor, forced labor, human trafficking for years now, and I'm sure that most of you and your companies already have um, processes in place to try and tackle these issues. Well, although most companies do have some initial, uh, initial elements of anti-human trafficking due diligence programs in place, they are often not sufficient. And why do I say this? Well, I think 2015 and the, the beginning of 2016 speaks for itself. So I'm going to take a wild guess and, and say that probably everyone in this room has read at least one article about the Associated Press or the Guardian's expo expose on um, slavery in uh, Thai fishing industry. There's also been, earlier this year, Amnesty International released a report pointing the finger at global smartphone companies for failing to detect child labor in their supply chains. 
And last year, the US maritime construction company, Signal International, filed for bankruptcy following court cases um, where they were, there were alleged uh, human trafficking um, of Indian workers to the, to the US to work in their supply chains. So there's a lot of focus. Your consumers care about this issue. Your investors care about this issue. And increasingly, governments care about this issue. And we're seeing unprecedented steps being taken by governments worldwide to tackle human trafficking and modern slavery in supply chains, starting right here in the United States with the strengthened US federal acquisition regulation rule on combating trafficking in persons. And this new, well, this amended rule makes it clear that Prime contractors are now responsible for violations, human trafficking violations, occurring at any stage in their supply chain. And uh, even more recently, the US Trade Facilitation and Trade Enforcement Act was enacted, and uh, we're already seeing the enforcement of this act, and merchandise that is thought to, be, to, have, been, to have involved uh, forced labor or child labor is starting to be blocked, uh, denied entry into the US. And the UK is following in the footsteps of the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act. And I think what's really interesting about the Modern Slavery Act is that it doesn't, it doesn't only ask uh, companies that are in scope of the act to disclose what efforts they're taking to eradicate human trafficking in their supply chains, but it's also requiring companies to get sign-off from the highest level of their organization on their, on their disclosures, on their statements. So you know, this is hopefully going to achieve more accountability. And then there's also the uh, EU directive on non-financial reporting that is looking at human rights and that will be asking um, companies to talk about the risks that they're facing to, in terms of human rights, what policies they have in place, and what steps they're doing to address these potential human rights violations or risks within their supply chains. And very relevant to all of us here today are the global SDG, or the SDGs that we've talked about today, human trafficking and the eradication of modern slavery and human trafficking, including in supply chains, is part of those goals and part of the targets. So it's a, there is a huge amount of focus on this topic at the moment, and I foresee that this will continue. And what does all this mean for companies? Well, it means that companies face stronger legal and ethical requirements to be more proactive and to have a more preventative approach uh, when it comes to tackling human trafficking and modern slavery, including child labor and forced labor in, in their supply chains and their businesses. It means that companies can no longer say, I didn't know it was happening when a violation occurs. And the challenge is often companies don't know that it is happening because of the nature of today's global supply chains. They are complex, they are long, they are non-transparent. It is incredibly difficult, as, as it's been brought up uh, already this morning, it is incredibly difficult for large companies to have visibility within their supply chains and to know where to target their efforts and their resources when they're trying to counter these risks. So let's talk a little bit about where companies can start uh, when they're looking at building an anti-human trafficking due diligence program. And then from there, we'll go and talk about how to go beyond compliance and look at engaging workers um, from the ground up. So establishing a robust anti-human trafficking due diligence program obviously takes a lot of work, takes a lot of commitment, and includes uh, a number of elements, and we unfortunately don't have time in the 45 minutes that we have to go into the details of all those elements today, but let's briefly look at some of them. It starts with making sure your own house is in order, obviously, and looking at strengthening your policies. And I find that a lot of the time, um, policies and codes of conduct, including supplier codes of conduct, have a general prohibition of forced labor or human trafficking, but they don't necessarily go into any more depth in terms of um, looking at the indicators or the practices that are related to human trafficking and forced labor. So for instance, it's, I, I hardly ever come across a supplier code of conduct that specifically prohibits charging recruitment fees, or that looks at ensuring return transportation for migrant workers, or that is asking suppliers to have verification criteria in place to select labor recruiters. So these things are, I think, uh, really important uh, to, to look at. And then once you, once you have stronger policies and you've sort of thought about your vision when it comes to human trafficking and fighting human trafficking in your supply chain, 
you need to be engaging suppliers. And there's been so, so much interesting discussion this morning and, and this afternoon about how to go about engaging suppliers and how to meaningfully do so. And whether it's about setting your expectations from the start very clearly, uh, whether it's about finding ways to incentivize your suppliers and, and to make sure that you're rewarding uh, loyalty and, um, and, and risk mitigation uh, for, by, from your suppliers. Um, having a way to track the progress of your suppliers so that you can make sure that you're rewarding the right suppliers. And it can also be, if you want to go one step further, it really is about consulting your suppliers from the very start, asking them, how do you think we should be addressing this? How can we together mitigate the risk of human trafficking? What do our policies, what do our codes of conduct need to look like? And so, I mean, at Ascend Compliance, the way we go, uh, we, we support our, com our customers um, a lot around risk assessment and risk mitigation. So in my day-to-day -day work, I often uh, come into contact with companies who ask me, well, how do I, I have, you know, thousands of suppliers, how do I know where to look? How do I know where to focus my money, my time, my, my audits, etc.? Where do I start? And I find, I, I usually put the question back on them and I say, well, what are you doing at the moment? And often what comes up is, well, you know, I focus, I put, I, I focus my resources on my highest spend suppliers. And I understand why companies do that. But highest spend doesn't necessarily mean highest risk. And if a violation does occur within a supply chain, it won't matter to consumers or investors or individuals whether it occurred within a high spend contract or not. It will matter that it happened within your supply chain. So we encourage um, sort of good risk mapping and risk assessment, and easier said than done, how do you, how do you go about uh, looking at risk? Well, in terms of human trafficking and forced labor, I find it useful to look at two different categories of risks. So the first being having a good understanding of what are the risks that affect your industry and your sector in particular when we're talking about human trafficking. Why is your industry or sector at a potentially higher risk of human trafficking? Is it because of uh, reliance on labor recruiters? Is it because of the seasonal nature of uh, the work? Is it because of reliance on migrant, low-skilled, vulnerable workers, the countries where your suppliers are operating, and so on? So the way we go about looking at risk is Collecting data from suppliers about, on the one hand, what does the environment within which their supply chain and which that supplier operate look like? What countries are they working in? What commodities are they dealing with? What are the characteristics of their workforce? And so on. And on the other hand, so those are largely unalterable risks, I like to say, but it's essential to be informed about those risks. On the other hand, you've got what policies and practices do your suppliers have in place to either protect workers from human trafficking and modern slavery, or to give, that give rise to uh, an increased risk of human trafficking and modern slavery. Now, once you have a better understanding of where the risks might lie, let's say with your tier one and tier two suppliers, it, it, it enables you to know where you need to dig further, where you go further, where you focus your money, your time, your efforts, uh, where you conduct specialized audits, etc. Um, so this is very useful and it helps you save money, that's one thing, but it also helps you be more aware of uh, your risks and it enables you to make better informed decisions when it comes to knowing which suppliers you want to continue working with, how you need to better um, support your suppliers, um, and so on. So. I've talked a little bit about risk identification. Uh, risk mitigation is another huge subject that I'd love to go into today with you, but, but I want us to have enough time to actually hear from you about your experiences. So I'm not going to talk about risk mitigation uh, right now. Um, instead, I want to talk about continuous improvement because a lot of you are sitting in this room here today because you believe in going beyond compliance. Compliance is a starting point and it is an essential starting point when we start looking at sustainability and human rights. But you're here because you believe that your companies, your organizations are leaders in terms of sustainability. You want to go further. And when you're looking at mitigating risk of human trafficking and modern slavery, you need to be looking beyond the factory floors. So the individuals that I've worked with in my, my past career um, had one thing in common. And that was that they'd all ended up in an exploitative situation because of vulnerability. So if you really want to 
eradicate human trafficking and be a part of the solution, yes, you need to have strong risk assessment, you need to have robust due diligence um, programs in place, and you also need to be thinking about how you can be engaged in initiatives that are going to look at the root causes of human trafficking and modern slavery and work with communities. And, and there's something I heard this morning that really struck me as very powerful. And George from Interface said, solutions come from employees. And that resonated with me because years ago, in the middle of nowhere in South Sudan where there weren't any beautiful crystal chandeliers, um, I worked with kids and I was looking at how to strengthen um, their protective environment. And you know, I, I had these ideas about how to have good programs in place, etc. And then one day I actually stopped and, and spoke to kids and talked with them and talked with their communities and their families. And they had so many ideas about how their environment could be strengthened, how their protection could be strengthened and how could they could be supported. So, it's the same right here, right? So I think um, companies can do so much when they engage not only, you know, we've heard about uh, public-private partnerships, we've heard about multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, I would love to hear from you about the initiatives that you have in place to engage workers. So I'm going to pass over to Mark and he can tell you more about that. And then once Mark is done, hopefully you'll all be uh, eager to share your successes and challenges, both in assessing risk in your supply chain, managing, you know, engaging your suppliers, and empowering workers from the ground up. Because as I said, vulnerability leads to human trafficking, and I think the, the private sector has a really key role to play in creating a virtuous circle of reducing vulnerability and therefore decreasing uh, the risk of human trafficking, better protecting people, and better protecting your business. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. That was a really good uh, introduction to a uh, risk-informed approach to, uh, to human trafficking. Um, so my name's Mark Robertson. I'm um, Director of Communications and Stakeholder Relations at the ICTI Care Foundation. Um, I, I, I don't know how many of you have heard of the ICTI Care Foundation, but essentially we are the um, ethical supply chain program for the global toy and entertainment industry. So we work with, at the top of the supply chain, uh, large toy brands um, and retailers, large and small globally. Um, we work with about 1,500 of those. Um, and at the bottom of the supply chain, we actually certify around about 2,000 factories. Uh, the majority of the factories we certify and work with are based in China, around about 95% of those. But increasingly, we're working a lot more in India and Vietnam as well. So via our program, we actually represent around about 800,000 workers. So that's a little bit about what we do. And today, really, I wanted just to pick up on, uh, on, on, on Kate's presentation and talk through some of the work that we're doing, um, really to shift our program from a traditional, if you like, compliance model more to, to, to beyond, going beyond compliance and actually working more from a worker-centric perspective. So really, I think for us, um, looking at the risks which exist in the supply chain linked to the toy industry, um, a lot of the risks really, the profile of risks associated with human trafficking, but other um, supply chain challenges as well, we find really worsen the further down the supply chain you go. So as, um, as Kate was pointing out, um, the risk profile increases um, at each tier. And we find as risks worsen further down the supply chain, within the toy industry supply chain, we also find that the, the kind of skills, capability, capabilities, and knowledge on how to actually tackle those issues also decreases. And really, we find that creates a bit of a kind of double whammy, if you like. So you have a worsening of, skill, a worsening of uh, risk, I should say, but you also have fewer skills, capabilities, and capacities to actually tackle those risks. So what that's meant for us is that as we've looked to develop our program, um, we've really made sure that a lot of our focus now is increased further down the supply chain. And we've shifted really away from compliance, or that's still a firm foundation of, of our work, more towards um, a continuous improvement model. So as you can see on screen, um, this, this, this slide here really kind of outlines some of the ways in which the work we're doing with the toy industry is developing beyond compliance, which is the blue areas on the right-hand side, more towards, sorry, from compliance, more towards beyond compliance activities, which are the activities on the, on, on the left-hand side. So compliance is still, with, with human trafficking and other issues, compliance is still very, very important. So 
Within our work, compliance is about setting standards and expectations and communicating those to suppliers. In doing so, it's about raising awareness of risks around human trafficking and modern-day slavery, child labour, those kind of issues as well. Um, it's also about making sure that you have the right level of data available so you can start to make broad-based risk assessments in your, in your supply chain, see where the key risks are, and then target your efforts appropriately. Um, we're also looking more on the compliance side at things like self-assessment, so asking um, suppliers to rate their own risks, um, cite the kind of policies, management systems they have in place to tackle different risks, so that you can actually use that information to decide where you're gonna tier, sorry, target your efforts beyond tier one. And of course, compliance also uh, gives you um, opportunities around due diligence and monitoring and assurance. So with our program, it's really, really important for the toy brands and retailers that use it, that we can give them a degree of confidence that the uh, factories and suppliers that they actually source from, if you like, have got the basic, uh, the basic requirements correct around things like working hours, uh, labor standards more generally, and human trafficking. So as we've grown and developed over the last 12 years, a lot of our work is really focused on compliance, but with our ultimate mission in mind, which is to protect and improve the, the lives of workers, we've realized more and more that we need to start to shift beyond that. So compliance gives you a great foundation and a great, a great, great initial starting, starting building blocks for your program, but we're increasingly shifting our focus more into the, the areas on the left-hand side. So for, the, for us, that means firstly looking at remedi remediation. So what kind of issues are, what are the factors which are causing issues to reoccur in our program? Um, we're also looking at um, purchasing practices at the top of the supply chain. So how can we work with toy brands and retailers to more effectively uh, manage their purchasing operations as well so that the decisions they make um, don't have detrimental effects on their suppliers in terms of things like lead times, that kind of stuff. Um, we're also working a lot more um, in collaboration with other organizations and in, a part in partnership models as well, and increasing the training um, and uh, learning um, that we deliver via program as well. So they're the kind of key areas, and what I was just going to do quickly now is talk through some, of, bring that to life a little bit and talk through some of the issues that we're tackling more through a beyond compliance uh, perspective than, than, than uh, the standard compliance approach. So... One of the major issues which exist um, within the toy supply chain, specifically in China, that we're, we're, we're coming across all the time, is actually associated with left-behind children. So this is an enormous issue and challenge in China. Um, and basically, the situation here is um, parents migrate from rural communities um, to the industrial south in China, which is where a lot of our certified factories are. Um, and in doing so, they're unable to bring their children uh, with them. And the numbers around this are actually staggering. So in China, um, it's estimated there's actually 61 million children who are left-at-home children um, and parented remotely. And of that 61 million, 70% um, of those um, see their, um, don't see their parents in, in a 12-month period. So a whole year will go by and they have no direct contact with their, uh, with their parents. So clearly for us, to tackle that issue, um, compliance has helped in terms of identifying it and help us understand the extent of it within our factories. But it doesn't really get us any near, anywhere nearer to actually helping to remedy the situation or support workers in our program. So as we kind of evolve our work, some of the, the kind of work that we're, that we're doing around um, supporting parents more effectively um, is, is, is various fold. So one of the things we're looking at right now are pilots related to um, basically remote, around remote parenting. So what we've actually got starting this summer are um, workshops and skills training sessions specifically for parents. Um, so basically these are um, free to attend workshops which look really at how to improve parents' well-being in factories. Um, tackle issues they have around being separated from their children, um, strengthen the kind of child-parent um, bond and how to do that effectively remotely, um, and actually get, engage with their children more effectively. And we're actually finding this as being really, really powerful, um, and it's obviously appreciated by workers, but it's also in interestingly appreciated by factory owners as well, because the more that they actually see these programs working, um, increasing well-being um, within their factories, reducing turnover, 
um, increase, increasing morale, you know, that for them adds up to a happier workforce and, and more productive workforce. So we're seeing some quite interesting evidence from the early pilots that we've looked at. With that kind of aim in mind, we're also looking at other um, programs which will enable children to spend time with their parents in factories. So that's, that requires a bit of work from our side to support um, the factories in our program, make sure that they create safe environments for children to be able to spend time on site, activities during the day, that kind of thing. But again, that's having a real benefit in terms of improving the lives of workers in our program and, and also providing opportunities for, um, for factories really to strengthen the uh, benefits they offer as employees. And as we find, I, I think it's, it's really worth noting at this point that the, the, there's a lot of shifts which are taking place in China within our program specifically, which are really creating extra challenges for suppliers which, which sit within it. So obviously labor costs are rising, um, the economic uh, conditions in China are also increasingly challenging. And all of that means that it's harder for uh, factories to, uh, to, to find employees. Um, it's actually more expensive um, for them to run their businesses. Um, there's all sorts of other challenges they face as well within that context. So the more that we can add value for them and provide opportunities for them to strengthen their relationships with, with their employees, the better. And we're getting some very good feedback on that. Um, linked to employee welfare, we're also, uh, we've also produced other resources as well to support workers. Most recently, a series of comic books, which are designed specifically for workers who are migrating from the industrial north to the, uh, sorry, the rural north to the industrial south in China. And again, they're really, they're proving very popular, and they're all about looking at what, really helping factory workers settle into an enti what can be an entirely different experience for them. So that's another example of, uh, of, of the work we're doing around, around, um, around remote parenting and, and migrant workers. Other issues as well, which we're looking at more through the lens of a, a kind of beyond compliance approach, are actually around forced student labor in China. So increasingly, we're finding instances of um, situations where basically um, students are, uh, well, a factory will pay a small recruitment fee or, or sometimes a larger recruitment fee to an academic institution. And in exchange for that fee, they'll get workers to work in their factory on, normally in a, in a, on a summer program. So from a factory's perspective, there's nothing wrong with that situation. They're paying the workers, and um, that, 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 that those transactions are happening directly with the workers, and they don't see a problem. However, data from audits, worker interviews, um, and also our worker helpline that we run in China has shown us that actually there is a problem here. And, and you often find with um, those kind of placements that the, uh, that the university in question places a requirement on that student to complete the, uh, the work assignment. And that means that they won't actually graduate or get their academic certification unless they, um, they complete that work, work placement. So it's a type of light forced labor, um, which we're picking up through audit. But, but really, I, I bring it today because whilst a compliance model will identify the issue, actually fixing that issue for us really just requires stepping beyond compliance. So the kind of work that we're doing to address those kind of issues focuses on raising awareness at the factory level through workshops and peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer learning networks. It's about us engaging with academic institutions to um, encourage them not to, um, to kind of create forced labor placements and design those out of the process. But we're also looking at other ways to, um, to, to kind of rethink the issue. So for example, providing more meaningful non-forced work placements for students. Um, so that's taking as an interesting direction as well. So for us, as, as, this, um, as this diagram really demonstrates, compliance provides the foundation for, uh, for, for the kind of key issues that we're all interested in here today. And obviously, the beyond compliance activities get you further to addressing them. And for us, really, it's a, a continuous model, really. And the ultimate aim is that as we continue to move through the different stages of, um, of remediation, training, capability building. Um, really, our program and other supply chain programs in other sectors should be shifting way, really, just from auditing for improvement and a lot more around, um, well, less on, less on compliance, a lot more around improvement. And we're looking at new ways to capture best practice in our program, reward those factories and suppliers, um, which are really just like to step, step above the level and, and, and innovate around worker welfare. And I think, 
whilst compliance will always be important, um, hopefully the, the, the chart on the uh, on screen right now shows you how they work together effectively. So that's the main, uh, they're the main insights I wanted to share. I think I'm now going to pass over to Kate to take it forward. this one working? Yes? Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Mark. Okay, so hopefully this has given you a little bit of food for thought so that we can now change things up a little bit and ask you guys questions instead of the other way around. Although, obviously, if you have questions for us, feel free. Um, but based on, you know, the initial um, points that we've just, that Mark and I have just raised, we would love to hear from you about... Um, Sorry, this was your, was yeah, this yours? <laughs> okay. We would like you to share your successes and challenges with us. So we could start with, for instance, how does your company assess and mitigate the risks of modern slavery in your supply chain? And if you don't have a process in place yet to look specifically at modern slavery, that's fine. Maybe you have some lessons learned that you think would be relevant from other areas of sustainability and compliance that might apply uh, to, to this um, topic and to human rights performance um, more generally. Does anyone out there want to be brave and, um, and tell us a little bit about what your company has been doing? Because <laughs> I know that, I mean, I don't know if Megan is still in the room, but I was really interested um, in hearing about what the body shop is doing and about how they have such a holistic and ambitious approach. And what really struck me was when Megan said um, that they were aiming to have 100% uh, traceability around their natural ingredients. That's, that's huge, right? And so I'm interested in knowing how companies at, at the moment are going about this. Um, I mean, at Ascent Compliance, we're talking with a lot of companies who are saying that they're struggling because of the fact that they have thousands of suppliers and they're finding it very dis difficult to, um, to obtain sort of supply chain visibility and traceability. I don't know if anyone wants to talk to that. Yes. Okay, thanks. Turn it back here. Um, so, so maybe I can talk through a couple of these so I don't um, take too many cycles. Um, so so I, I started to talk about this in my discussion a few minutes ago around having a good risk sensing mechanism and understanding that, you know, like probably a lot of big companies, we have a lot of suppliers. You know, it goes really deep to electronics are pretty complex. Um, you know, you trace that all the way back to the mine. And, talk about six or seven levels of suppliers and, and that makes it important to be able to triangulate from multiple sources and so not just from your own audit results and your suppliers audit results but what you're hearing through risk indices so maple croft etc um, where hot spots might be in relation to your sourcing areas uh, but also co coming to events like this um, going to UN forums whatever it is getting out there and listening especially what's happening and what the learnings from other industries. Um, you can find pretty quickly, you know, one of the connections we've made recently is in, um, you know, the service and for migrant worker uh, trafficking risks in the services industry in the Gulf states, right? And we learned that by talking to the construction industry um, and say, well, gosh, we do. Um, we have services uh, in the Gulf states and uh, so that's something we need to investigate and really dig down into. And okay, let, let's 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 try try to map and triangulate all these different risks and prioritize them. And and nobody's going to be able to understand every risk at every supplier. So so I think anyway. So, so that's that's part of it. It's a, it's a net um, that you need to build for yourself. Um, and may, maybe talking a little bit about getting into some of the other questions on engaging suppliers and fighting modern slavery from the ground up. It, kind of back to the worker. Like how do you get them back involved? Um, and I'll, I'll, take it, I'll take this from the IT industry standpoint and a program that the ICC's been working on with a, with a um, consulting firm called Elevate at Hong Kong. Uh, it's called, uh, again, work, Workplace of Choice. The idea is that you want to create 
um, a work environment that workers want to come to, right? They want to stay, right? Um, and so that means you need to understand, you, you need to understand, well, you need to educate the workers as a training component. You need to survey the workers to see what they want. And then you have to give them a voice as well. Um, and so, so that, that's been set up, or is in the process of being set up in Malaysia using a third party grievance mechanism uh, to amplify their voice and understand what's going on, but also to invest in the factory and the workers in the factories to create that workplace of choice um, and show that the supplier, that having a stable workforce that isn't full of modern day slaves is actually beneficial for their, for, for their, for their company. Um, so, so anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, that was really interesting. Thanks a lot. Does anyone else want to? Nope. <laughs> Did you want to add something to that? No, I mean, really, just to add that from our from our sector specific, from our spe uh, kind of perspective, the I think worker voice is really, really key, um, and we're looking at new technologies and ways to better facilitate um, worker voice, if you like. So, a, how do we more effectively? capture different perspectives so within audit programs we also use um, things like worker interviews and that kind of stuff but increasingly we're trialing new technologies through things like wechat um, and also we run a, a worker helpline which is available actually to multiple sectors in china and that that's that's creating lots of really useful information for, for the brands that use our program because it's it's more objective um, information that can really understand, help them understand what the key challenges are, but also it's there as an extra sense check for them to understand you know, where standards are at and whether or not workers concur with the kind of data that you collect from audits. So I'd, I'd, I'd really just reiterate the worker voice piece to that. Um, I, think, I, I think what you was, is it still working? <laughs> Do you want yes. No. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I think what you were just saying about the importance of triangulating information is really is really key, and that makes me think about the importance of not making assumptions about where risk might or might not be. Um, as I was saying earlier, um, sometimes companies because they're not quite sure maybe where to start, uh, might, as I said, look at highest spend rather than sort of consistently and systematically ac assess risk um, across the board. And I think that's really important um, to not make that assumption of, well, you know, I think this is a higher area of risk, so that's where I'm going to look. But doing that based on fact, based on data that's been collected, based on <clears throat> findings um, and research that's out there, um, and it's not an easy, uh, an easy thing to do, um, and that's why I, I suppose from Ascent Compliance's point of view, that's why we do find it very beneficial to have an automated process to do this, to do this, so that you can sort of consistently and systematically collect data from across the board um, to be able to know where to to better target your resources. Um, and alongside that, maybe having, maybe using monitoring and detection services to also pick up uh, on uh, potential violations or, you know, indications of risk when it comes to um, human trafficking, but also human rights issues more widely. Oh, yes, please. Just more of a question. I mean, are there plans to have some kind of certification programs, and, you know, across industry sectors for to, you know, to say a particular supplier is quote unquote modern slavery free, whatever the term, right term would be. Is, there, is something like that already existence or is something that's already been planned that you guys are aware of? Mm. You might want to. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, I think where the, the kind of activity that we're seeing is, is, is really at the kind of sector level. So I think each program is, I mean, it's obviously human trafficking, modern day slavery is something we've been looking at a while, for a long time. Um, in terms of a kind of a universal set of agreed standards or codes, um, I, we, we don't see that. I think we're more, because we work more kind of intimately with brands and, and retails in the toy space, they're deferring to us more and more um, for their compliance around human trafficking, modern day slavery, bribery and corruption issues. So it, we haven't seen a kind of multi-sector approach as yet. Um, and actually, I think human trafficking, modern day slavery are issues where we, 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 the impression we have is that brands almost want to work more on an applied specific level. The reason being that the kind of risk profiles around, around those issues are, are, are very different at the country level and also at the kind of industry specific level. So for example, in the toy industry, a lot of, um, pro, a lot of the factories that, that are in our program in China 
a relatively low risk around modern day slavery, human, human trafficking. As we, as we kind of start to expand into India though and Vietnam, that profile, obviously the risk profile changes overnight, but the kind of remediation we need to look, like, look at as well changes. In the toy industry, seasonality is an enormous issue. So uh, most toy production ramps, ramps up actually round about begin, beginning now and then through the summer months, um, obviously in order to meet um, Christmas deadlines. So the risks around, around our sector are very kind of seasonal um, and quite regional. So for those kind of reasons, we're seeing, we're seeing more of a kind of sector specific approach. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. And I think, I think eventually there does need to be a standardized approach. And actually, um, and, and this is what we're thinking at Ascent Compliance is at the moment, you know, we're looking at anti-human trafficking, in part because um, there's been so much focus on this, uh, on this human rights violation, as I was talking about earlier. But I believe that the approach needs to be more holistic and needs to be looking, needs to be looking at human rights as a whole. So that's where I think uh, the conversation is heading, especially when we're looking at the, uh, the EU directive. Um, you know, they're, they're talking about human rights. Um, maybe the SDGs might also sort of help push that, that effort and that conversation along uh, around having a more standardized approach to human rights violations within supply chains. That's what I'm hoping for, um, and that's what we're preparing for uh, within my, my company, at least. Hi, John Gladhill, Transwestern. Um, thank you both. Tough topic. <laughs> Hardest one in the room, I think. When you look at risk versus transparency, when somebody walks up and says, how do you do your supply chain? How do you orchestrate what I'm doing with my start to finish? How do you help them with that? How do you advise them on that? Yeah. The part that worries them in the first one third that they have no visibility on. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> um, thank you. That's a very good question. I, it's a complex issue, right? And it needs to be looked at from different angles. So the first angle is looking at your policies, your code of conduct, what you have in place. And often that does need to be improved and strengthened because engaging suppliers is also demonstrating that you're practicing what you preach. And um, so I think it starts there, and it starts with having a clear action plan on what you want to achieve and, um, and also understanding what you're in scope of in terms of compliance, right? Because it does start with compliance. So, and understanding whether your suppliers are in scope of any of the legislation that, for instance, I mentioned uh, earlier. And by the way, on your chairs, you all are supposed to mention this earlier. You've all got a scoping guide about some of the anti-human trafficking legislation that's out right now. Uh, so I think it starts with looking at that, the internal mechanisms. And then starting with tier one and tier two suppliers, right, collecting data from them on their policies, on their practices, on the risks that they face, on where they're operating in the world, on what uh, commodities uh, can be found in their supply chain, and sort of looking at that against what we know, research that's out, that is out there, whether it's the US uh, Trafficking in Persons report or uh, expert NGO, NGO reports such as Verite or what the ILO is doing or UN Global Compact. There's so much out there. Um, so looking at that, and then, as I was saying earlier, I think it's about saying to uh, companies, or this is what we say to our customers, once you have a better understanding of the risk at tier one and tier two levels, that's good, that's really important, and it's essential for compliance, but it's not enough. You have to go further, but having that initial risk mapping tells you where you might want to be focusing further, and then it is about you know, having uh, audits and maybe Maybe encouraging auditors to, uh, or allowing auditors to go further upstream in supply chains and look where they need to be looking uh, to find violations. And I think there have been some questions that have been raised recently, actually, uh, the earlier this year um, in a report by uh, the University of Sheffield, talking about how audits sometimes are, are not able to access, uh, to, to find the human rights violations that they're supposed to be looking for because companies are afraid, right, understandably so, of, of what might be found. So I think it's about being brave as well. And I think what Nestle said last year around when they stood up and said, yes, there is slavery in our supply chains in, in the Thai fishing industry. And if anyone else out there thinks that there isn't, then they're kidding themselves. I think that was very brave. And I think that elicited a really positive response from the public. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but, but it's a nag. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
just just to just to add a little. Um, so I think from a again taking more of a kind of beyond compliance perspective on it. For us, I think it's on generally. I think it's also about really good communication. So I think obviously, the more that your suppliers at all tiers are aware of your objectives and your requirements and, and where they come from, be that legislation or just rooted in your own um, sustainability approach and what the expectations are, I think that's when you start to see kind of important shifts as well. I mean, you know, so good supply chain management shouldn't just be about kind of firing demands down the supply chain. It should be about strong communication and working with factories or suppliers that you work with in your supply chain. So they, they're on board with your overall approach. They understand why you're looking at issues, and they're engaged with that. And I mean, that doesn't always work, but we see, you know, we, we've seen the biggest impact when the brands that we work with uh, are really stepping up in terms of communication and, and working more directly with their suppliers. So I think communication is, is really important as well. I think we're, we're slightly, slightly over. Yes. No. Okay, well, I think we'll, uh, we'll have to leave it here, but thank you very much uh, for your questions and for your input. Uh, it's really interesting talking to you, all of you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.